<laughs> I thought you were going to finish it. It's one of the greatest themes in all of film history. Yeah, it's great. So I was just thinking about the Roman Empire, as one does. <laughs> There's that whole meme uh, where <laughs> old guys are thinking yeah. about the Roman Empire at least yeah. once a day. And half the population is confused whether it's true or not. But more seriously, thinking about the wars going on in the world today, and as you know, uh, war and military conquest has been a big part of uh, Roman society and culture, and it I think has been a big part of most empires and dynasties throughout human history. So yeah, they usually uh, came as a result of conquest. I mean, yeah. there's some like the Austro-Hungarian Empire where there was just a lot of uh, sort of clever marriages. Um, but fundamentally, there's an engine of conquest. And yeah, they celebrate excellence in warfare. Many of the leaders were excellent generals. Yeah, that kind of thing. So, big picture question. Grok approved. I asked if this is a good question to ask. Get tested, cool. Grok approved? Yeah. <laughs> uh, at least on fun mode. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to what degree do you think war is part of human nature versus a consequence of uh, how human societies are structured? I asked this as you have somehow controversially been a proponent of peace. I'm, I'm generally a proponent of peace. I mean, Ignorance is perhaps, in my view, the real enemy to be countered. That's the real hard part, not, you know, fighting other humans. Um, but all, all creatures fight. I mean, the, the, the jungle is a, you look at the, people think of, of this nature as perhaps some sort of peaceful thing, but in fact, it is not. There's some quite funny Werner Herzog thing mm -hmm. where he's like in the jungle, like saying that it's like basically just murder and death in every direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the plants and animals in the jungle are constantly trying to kill and eat each other every single day, every minute. So it's not like, uh, you know, we're unusual in that respect. Well, this, there's a relevant question here, whether with greater intelligence uh, comes greater control over these base instincts for violence. Yes. We have much more of an ability to control our, our um, limbic instinct for violence than, say, a chimpanzee. And in fact... If, you, if one looks at, say, chimpanzee society, it is not friendly. I mean, the bonobos are an exception. Um, but chimpanzee society is uh, filled with violence and it's quite quite horrific, frankly. That, that's, that's our limbic system in action. Like, you don't want to be on the wrong side of a chimpanzee. It'll eat your face off and tear your nuts off. Yeah, basically, there's no limits or ethics or... Uh, the Romans had just war. There's no just war in, the ch in chimpanzee societies. Is, is war and, and, and dominance by any means necessary? Yeah, chimpanzee society is a pr like a primitive version of human society. Um, it's, it's, they're not like peace loving, basically, um, at all. Um, there, there's extreme violence. Um, and then once in a while, some, some, somebody who's watched too many Disney movies decides to raise a chimpanzee as a pet. Um, and then that eats their face or rips their nuts off or chews their fingers off, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's happened several times. Uh, ripping your nuts off is an interesting strategy <laughs> for interaction. <laughs> so it's happened to people. It's un unfortunate. Like, that's, I guess, a one way to ensure that the other chimp doesn't, uh, mm -hmm. you know, contribute to the gene pool. Well, from a martial arts perspective, it's a fascinating strategy. <laughs> the, 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 the nut ripper. <laughs> I wonder which of the martial arts teaches that. <laughs> I think it's safe to say if somebody's <laughs> got your nuts in their hands <laughs> and has the option of rubbing them off, you will be amenable to uh, whatever they want. Yeah. Safe to say. <laughs> so like I said, somehow controversially, you've been a uh, proponent of peace on, on Twitter, on X. Yeah. So let me ask you about the wars going on today and to see what the path to peace could be. How do you hope the current war in Israel and Gaza comes to an end? Uh, what path do you see that can minimize human suffering in the long term in that part of the world? Well, I think it, it, that that part of the world is is definitely like if you look up the there is no easy answer in the dictionary. It'll be that like the picture of uh, the Middle East um, in Israel, especially. So there is no easy answer. Um, 
or what my this is strictly my opinion of uh, you know uh, is that uh, the the goal of Hamas was to provoke an overreaction from Israel. Um, they obviously did not expect to uh, you know have a military victory, um, but they they expect they, they really wanted to commit the worst atrocities that they could in order to provoke the the most aggressive response possible from Israel. Um, and then leverage that uh, aggressive response to um, rally Muslims worldwide uh, for the cause of uh, Gaza and Palestine, which they have succeeded in doing. Um, so the, 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 the counterintuitive thing here, I think that the, the thing that I think should be done, even though it is very difficult, uh, is that um, I, I would recommend that Israel engage in the most cons conspicuous acts of kindness possible. Every po everything. That is the actual thing that would thwart the goal of Hamas. So in some sense, the degree that makes sense in geopolitics, turn the other cheek, implemented. It's not exactly turn the other cheek, um, because I do think that there's... Um, you know, th th I think it, it is appropriate for... Israel to find the Hamas members and, you know, um, either either kill them or incarcerate them. Um, like that, something that something has to be done because that they're just going to keep 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 coming otherwise. Um, but uh, in addition to that, they need to do whatever they can. Um, there's some talk of uh, establishing, for example, a mobile hospital. I'd recommend doing that. Um, just making sure that uh, you know there's food, water, uh, medical necessities, um, and and just be over the top about it and be very transparent, so it's it, so that it can't people can't claim it's a trick, like just put a webcam on the thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all twenty four seven. Deploy acts of kindness. Yeah, conspicuous acts of kindness. That that with that are unequivocal, meaning that can't be somehow, because Hamas will then their response will be, oh, it's a trick. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have to counter how how is it not a trick? This ultimately fights the broader force of hatred in the in the region. Yes, and I'm not sure who said it. It's an, an apocryphal saying, but an eye for the for an eye makes everyone blind. Now, now that neck of the woods, they really believe in the whole eye for an eye thing. Um, but I mean, you really have. If if you're not going to just outright uh, commit genocide, like against an entire people, which obviously would not be acceptable to to, to uh, really shouldn't be acceptable to anyone, um, then you, you're going to leave basically a lot of people alive who subsequently, you know, hate Israel. So really, the question is like, how for for every Hamas member that you kill, how many did you create? Mm -hmm. And if you create more than you killed, you've not succeeded. That's the, you know, the real situation there. Um, and it's safe to say that if, you know, um, if, you know, if, if you kill somebody's child in Gaza, if you've, you've made at least a few uh, Hamas members who will die just to, just to kill an Israeli. That's the situation. So, <clears throat> but but I mean, this is one of the most contentious subjects one could possibly discuss. But but I, I think if if the if the goal ultimately is some sort of long term peace, one has to be look at this from the standpoint of over time, are there more or fewer uh, terrorists being created? Let me just uh, linger on war. Yeah, well, war. I would safe to say wars always existed and always will exist. Always will exist. Always has, always has existed, and always will exist. I hope not. You and think always, it always will? will? Always, there will always be war. This question of just how much war, and and um, you know what, you know, there's this, there's this, the sort of the scope and scale of war. Mm -hmm. But to, ma I, to imagine that there would not be any war in the future, I think, would be a very unlikely outcome. Yeah, you talked about the culture series. There's war even there. Yes, there's a giant war. The first book starts off with um, a gigantic galactic war where trillions die, trillions. But it still nevertheless protects these pockets of 
of flourishing. Some, somehow you can have galactic war and still have pockets of flourishing. Yeah, I mean, it's. <laughs> I guess if, if, if we are able to one day expand to, you know, f- full the galaxy or whatever, there will be a, a galactic war at some point. Ah, uh, the scale. I mean, the scale of war has been increasing, increasing, increasing. It's like a race between the scale of suffering and the scale of flourishing. Yes. A lot of people seem to be using this tragedy to beat the drums of war and feed the military industrial complex. Do you worry about this? The people who are rooting for escalation and how can it be stopped? One of the things that does concern me is that there are very few people alive today who actually uh, viscerally understand the horrors of war, at least in the US. I mean, obviously there are people in, on the front lines in Ukraine and Russia who understand just how terrible war is. Um, but how many people in, in the West understand it? Um, you know, my grandfather was in World War II. Uh, he was severely traumatized. I um, mean, he was there, for, I think, in the, for almost six years in the you know, in uh, East and North Africa and Italy. Uh, all his friends were killed uh, in front of him, and uh, he would have died too, um, except they randomly gave some, I guess, IQ test or something, and uh, he scored very high. Um, now he was not an officer; he was, a, I think, a corporal or a sergeant or something like that, um, because he didn't finish high school. Um, he had to drop out of high school because his, his his dad died, and he had to work to support his uh, siblings. Um, so, because he didn't graduate high school, he was not eligible for the officer corps. Um, so, you know, he kind of got put into the cannon fodder category, mm-hmm. <laughs> basically. Um, but then, just randomly, they gave him this test. He it was transferred to British intelligence in London. That's where he met my grandmother. Um, but uh, he, he had PTSD next level, like next level. I mean, just didn't talk, just didn't talk. And if you tried talking to him, he'd just tell you to shut up. And he won a bunch of medals, never never bragged about it once, not, not even hinted, nothing. I like found out about it because I, his military records were online. That's, uh, that's how, well, how I know. So... He would say, "Like, no, no way in hell. Do you want to? Do you want to do that again?" But how many people? Um, now he he obviously he, now he died, you know, twenty years ago or longer, actually thirty years ago. Um, how many people are alive that remember World War Two? Not many. And the same perhaps applies to the threat of nuclear war. <sighs> yeah, I mean, there are enough nuclear bombs pointed at the uh, United States to. Make the rubble, the radioactive rubble, bounce many times. There's two major wars going on right now. So you talked about the threat of AGI quite a bit, but now as we sit here with the intensity of conflict going on, do you worry about nuclear war? I think we shouldn't discount the possibility of nuclear war. Um, it is a civilizational threat. Um, Right now, I could be wrong, but I think the, the, the current probability of nuclear war is quite low. Um, but there are a lot of nukes pointed at us. So, and we have a lot of nukes pointed at other people. They're still there. Nobody's put their uh, their guns away. The, the missiles are still in the silos. And uh, the leaders don't seem to be the ones with the nukes talking to each other. No. There are wars which are tragic and difficult on a, on a local basis. And then there are wars which are civilization ending or have that potential. Obviously global thermonuclear warfare has high potential to end civilization, perhaps, perhaps permanently, but certainly you know, to severely uh, wound and, and perhaps uh, set back uh, human progress by you know to the stone age or something. I don't know, pretty bad. Um, probably scientists and engineers want to be super popular after that as well. <laughs> They're like, you got us into this mess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so generally, we, I think we, we obviously want to prioritize civilizational risks over things that are um, painful and tragic on, on a local level, but not civilizational. How do you hope the war in Ukraine comes to an end? And what's the path, once again, to minimizing human suffering there? Uh, well, I think that 
what what is likely to happen, uh, which is really pretty much the the way it is, is that um, something very close to the current lines uh, will be how a ceasefire or truce happens. But you know, you, you just have a situation right now where whoever goes on the offensive. Um, will suffer casualties at several times the rate of whoever's on the defense. Because mm-hmm. um, you've got uh, defense in depth, you've got minefields, uh, trenches, anti-tank defenses. Um, nobody has air superiority because um, the, the, the anti-aircraft missiles are really far better than the, the aircraft. Like there are far more of them. Um, and uh, so neither side has uh, air superiority. Um, tanks are basically death traps. Um, just slow moving, and they're, they're not immune to anti tank weapons. Mm-hmm. So you you really just have long range artillery um, and uh, infantry trenches. It's World War One, all over again mm-hmm. with drones. You know, throwing old drones, some some drones there, um, which makes the long range artillery just that much more accurate and yeah. better, and so more efficient at murdering people on both sides. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's. Whoever is, you don't, you don't, you don't want to be trying to advance uh, from either side because the probability of dying is incredibly high. Um, so, in order to overcome uh, defense in depth trenches and minefields, you really need a significant local superiority in numbers. Um, ideally, combined arms, where where you you do a fast attack with aircraft. A, a concentrated number of tanks um, and a lot of people. That's the only way you're going to pu- punch through a line. And then you're going to punch through and, st- and and then not have reinforcements just kick you right out again. I mean, if, if you, I, I really recommend people read uh, World War One warfare in detail. That's rough. Um, I mean, the sheer number of people that died there was mind-boggling. And it's almost impossible to um, imagine the end of it that doesn't look like almost exactly like the beginning in terms of wh- what land belongs to who and so on. But on the other side of a lot of human suffering, death yes. and destruction of infrastructure. Yes, I mean, the, the thing that, the, the reason I, I you know, proposed a, a, some sort of truce or, or, or peace a year ago was because I predicted pretty much exactly what would, would happen, uh, which is a lot of people dying for basically almost no changes in land. Um, and this, the, the, the loss of the, the flower of Ukrainian and Russian youth, and we should have some sympathy for the, the Russian boys as well as the Ukrainian boys, because the Russian boys didn't, didn't ask to be on their front line. They have to be. So, um, there's a lot of sons not, not come back to their parents, you know, and and I think most of them don't don't really have, they don't hate the other side, you know. It's sort of like, is this saying about like this, this saying comes from World War One? It's like young boys who don't know each other killing each other on behalf of old men that do know each other. <sighs> the hell's the point of that? So Volodymyr Zelensky said that he's not, or has said in the past, he's not interested in talking to Putin directly. Do you think he should yeah. sit down, man to man, leader to leader, and negotiate peace? Look, I think I would just recommend do not send the flower of Ukrainian youth to be to die uh, in trenches. Uh, whether he talks to Putin or not, just don't do that. Um, whoever goes on the offensive will lose massive numbers of people. Um, and history will not look kindly upon them. You've spoken honestly about the possibility of war between US and China in the long term, if no diplomatic solution is found. For example, on the question of Taiwan and one China policy. Right. How do we avoid the trajectory where these two superpowers clash? Well, it's it's worth reading that book on the the uh, difficult to pronounce Thucydides trap, I believe it's called. I love war history. I like inside out and backwards. Um, 
There's hardly a battle I haven't read, read about. And, and trying to figure out like what, what really was the cause of victory in any particular case, as opposed mm -hmm. to what one side or another claimed was the, the reason. Both the victory and what sparked the war. And yeah, yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. So that Athens and Sparta is a classic case. The thing about the Greeks is they really wrote down a lot of stuff. They loved writing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are lots of interesting things that happened in many parts of the world, but they just, people just didn't write it down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we don't know what happened. Or they didn't really write with in detail. They just mm -hmm. would say, like, we went, we had a battle and we won. And like, well, what? Can you add a bit more? Um, <laughs> the, the, the Greeks, they really wrote a lot. <laughs> They were very articulate on, it. they just love writing. So, mm -hmm. and we have a bunch of that writing that's preserved. So we know what led up to the uh, Peloponnesian War between um, the Spartan and Athenian alliance. Um, and uh, we, we know that they, they, for quite, they, they saw it coming. I mean, the Spartans didn't write, they, they also weren't very verbose by their nature, but they did write, but they weren't very verbose. <laughs> yeah, they were terse. Uh, but the, the, Athenians and the other Greeks wrote, wrote a line. And they were like, um, and Sp Sparta was really kind of like the leader of, of Greece. Um, but, but Athens grew stronger and stronger with each passing year. And, um, and everyone's like, well, that's inevitable that there's gonna be a clash between Athens and Sparta. Uh, well, how do we avoid that? And they couldn't, they couldn't, they actually, they saw it coming and they still could not avoid it. <laughs> so, you know, at some point, if there's, if, if one uh, group, one civilization or, or country or whatever um, exceeds another, sort of like if, you know, the United States has been the biggest kid in the block for, since I think around 1890 for, from an economic standpoint. So the United States has been the economic, most powerful economic engine in the world longer than anyone's been alive. Um, and the foundation of war is economics. So now we have a situation in the case of China where the, um, the economy is likely to be two, perhaps three times larger than that of the US. So imagine you're the biggest kid on the block for as long as anyone can remember, and suddenly a kid comes along who's twice your size. So we see it coming. Yeah. How is it possible to stop? Is there some, let me throw something out there, just intermixing of cultures, understanding. There does seem to be a giant cultural gap in understanding of each other. And you're an interesting case study because you are an American, obviously mm -hmm. you've done a lot yes. of uh, incredible manufacture here in the United States, but you also work with China. I've spent a lot of time in China and met with the leadership many times. Maybe a good question to ask is, what are some things about China that people don't understand, positive, just in the culture? What's some interesting things that you've learned about the Chinese? Well, uh, the, the sheer number of really smart, hardworking people in China is um, incredible. Uh, there are, I believe, if you say like, how many smart, hardworking people are there in China? There's far more of them there than there are here, I think, in my, in my opinion. Um, the, uh, and they've got a lot of energy. So, I mean, the, the architecture in China that's in recent years is far more impressive than the US. I mean, in the, the, the train stations, the buildings, the high speed rail, everything, it's um, really far more impressive than what we have in the US. I, I mean, I recommend somebody just go to Shanghai and Beijing, look at the buildings and go to, you know, take the train from Beijing to Xi'an where you have the terracotta warriors. Um, China's got an incredible history, a uh, very long history. And, um, you know, I think arguably the, in terms of the use of language from, from a written standpoint, um, sort of one of, one of the oldest, perhaps, perhaps the oldest written language. And, and then China, people did, did write things down. So, um, now China um, historically has always been with rare exception, been internally focused. Um, they've not been acquisitive. Uh, they've, they've fought each other. There've been many, many civil wars. Mm -hmm. um, in the Three Kingdoms War, 
I believe they lost about 70% of their population. So, and, and that knows. so the, they've had brutal internal wars, like civil wars that make the US civil war look t small by comparison. Um, so it, I think it's important to appreciate that China is not uh, monolithic. Mm -hmm. um, we sort of think of like China as a sort of one entity of one mind, and this is definitely not the case. Um, from what I've seen, and I think most people who understand China would agree, that people in China think about China 10 times more than they think about anything outside of China. So it's like 90% of their consideration is, uh, you know, are, is, is, is internal. Well, isn't that a really positive thing? When you're talking about the collaboration and a future peace between superpowers, when you're inward facing, which is like focusing on improving yourself versus focusing on, yeah, uh, quote unquote, improving others through military might. The good news, the history of China suggests that China is not acquisitive, meaning they're not gonna go out and invade a whole bunch of countries. Mm -hmm. um, now they do feel very strongly, you know, so that's that's good. I mean, because a lot of lot of very powerful countries have been acquisitive. Mm -hmm. um, the, the US is one of the, also one of the rare cases that has not been acquisitive. Like in, after World War II, the US could have basically taken over the world and any country, like we got nukes, nobody else got nukes. We don't even have to lose soldiers. Uh, which country do you want? Mm -hmm. And the United States could have taken over everything. Oh, it, at will, and it didn't. Um, and the United States actually helped rebuild countries. So it helped rebuild Europe, you know, helped rebuild Japan. Um, this is very unusual behavior, almost unprecedented. Um, you know, the US did conspicuous acts of kindness, like the Berlin airlift, you know. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, there's, it's always like, well, America's done bad things. Well, of course, America's done bad things, but one needs to look at the, uh, the whole track record. Um, and, and just generally, you know, one, one sort of test would be, how do you treat your prisoners of war? Mm -hmm. Or let's say, um, you know, no offense to the Russians, but let's say you're in Germany, it's 1945. You got the Russian army coming on one side, and you got the French, British, and American armies coming on the other side. Who would you like to be to surrender to? Like no country is like morally perfect, but I recommend uh, being a POW with the Americans. That would be my choice very strongly. <laughs> in the full menu of POW. Very the US. much so. <laughs> and in fact, one of our Brown um, yeah. took, you know, a small guy, I uh, was like, we've got to be captured by the Americans. Yep. And uh, in, in fact, the SS was under orders to execute Von Braun and all of the uh, German rocket engineers. Uh, and they narrowly escaped their SS. They, they, they said they were going out for a walk in the woods. They left in the middle of winter with no coats. Uh, and <laughs> then ran like, with no food, no coats, no water. And just ran like hell uh, and ran west. Um, and by sheer like they, I think his brother found like a, a bicycle or something, and um, and then just cycled west as fast as he could and found found a U.S. patrol. Um, so anyway, that's that's one that's one way you can tell morality is who, 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 where do you want to be a POW? <laughs> it's, it's not fun anywhere, but some places are much worse than others. So um, anyway, so 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 I think America has been. Uh, while far from perfect, uh, generally a, a benevolent force. Um, and uh, we should always be self-critical and uh, we try to be better. Um, but um, anyone with half a brain knows that. So so I think there are, in this way, China and uh, the United States are similar. Ne neither country has been acquisitive. Um, in, in a significant way. So that's like a, you know, a, a shared principle, I guess. Um, now, now China does feel very strongly about Taiwan. They've been very clear about that for a long time. Um, you know, from this standpoint, it's, it's, it would be like one of the states is, is, is you know, not, not there like, like Hawaii or something like that, but, but more significant than Hawaii, you know. Um, 
in Hawaii is pretty significant for us. So um, that they, they view it as, as as really the that there's a fundamental part of China, uh, the island of Formosa, now, now Taiwan, that is um, not part of China but should be. Uh, and the only reason it, it hasn't been is because of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. And as their economic power grows, and as their military power grows, the thing that they are clearly saying uh, is their interest will, you know, clearly be materialized. Yes, China has been very clear that um, they will incorporate Taiwan uh, peacefully or uh, militarily, but that they will incorporate it from their standpoint is 100% likely. You know, something you said about conspicuous acts of kindness, as a geopolitical policy, it almost seems naive, but I'd venture to say that this is probably the path forward, how you avoid most wars. Just as you say mm -hmm. it, it sounds naive, but it's kind of brilliant. If you believe in the goodness of underlying most of human nature. It just seems like conspicuous acts of kindness can uh, reverberate through the populace of the countries involved. And, yeah, well. And de-escalate. Absolutely, so for, in, in, after World War I, the, the, they made a big mistake. You know, they, they basically tried to lump all the blame on Germany um, and um, and, and it, you know, settled Germany with uh, impossible reparations. Um, and, you know, really there was a lot of, there was a fair, quite a bit of blame to um, go around for World War I. Um, but they, they try to, you know, put it all on Germany. Um, and uh, that was, that, that laid the seeds for World War II. Uh, so, it's a lot of people, well, not just Hitler, a lot of people felt wronged. Um, and they wanted vengeance. And they got it. People don't forget. Yeah. You, 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 know, you kill somebody's father, mother, son, daughter, they're not going to forget it. They will want vengeance. Um, so after World War II, they're like, well, the Treaty of Versailles was a huge mistake um, in World War One. And um, so this time, instead of, uh, you know, crushing the losers, we're, we're actually gonna help them with the Marshall Plan and we're gonna help rebuild, re rebuild uh, Germany. Um, we're gonna help rebuild, uh, or, you know, Austria and the, the other, you know, Italy and whatnot. So, um, and that was the right move. There is a, it does feel like there's a profound truth to uh, conspicuous acts of kindness being an antidote to this. Something must stop the the cycle of reciprocal violence. Something must stop it, or it will, you know, it'll 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 never stop. Just eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, limb for a limb, life for a life, forever and ever. To escape briefly the darkness with some incredible engineering work. Uh, XAI just released Grok AI Assistant mm -hmm. that I've gotten a chance to play with. It's uh, it's amazing on many levels. First of all, it's amazing that a relatively small team in a relatively short amount of time was able to develop this close to state of the art system. Uh, another uh, incredible thing is there's a regular mode and there's a fun mode. Yeah, I guess I'm to blame for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, it, first of all, I wish everything in life had a fun mode. Yeah. I, there's something compelling beyond just fun about the fun mode yeah. interacting with a large language model. I'm not sure exactly what it is because I've only had a little bit of time to play with it, but it just makes it more interesting, more vibrant to interact with the system. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I, um, our, our, our AI Grok is modeled after the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, one of my favorite books, uh, which is, it's a book on philosophy disguised as a book on humor. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
I would say that is that forms the basis of my philosophy, uh, which is that we don't know the meaning of life, but the more we can expand the scope and scale of consciousness, digital and biological, the more we are able to understand what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. So I have a philosophy of curiosity. There is generally a feeling like this AI system has an outward looking, like the way you are like sitting with a good friend, looking up at the stars, like the, the asking pothead like questions about the universe, wondering what it's all about, the curiosity you talk about. There, there's a sense, no matter how mundane the question I ask it, there's, there's a sense of cosmic grandeur to the whole thing. Well, we, we are actually working hard to have uh, engineering, math and physics answers that you can count on. Mm -hmm. um, so for the other sort of AIs out there, the, what is these so-called large language models. Um, I've not found the uh, engineering to be reliable. Um, and it, it, the hallucination, it, it unfortunately hallucinates mo most when you least want it to hallucinate. Yeah. <laughs> so when you ask important, diff difficult questions, it, that's when it tends to be confidently wrong. Um, so we're really tr trying hard to say, okay, how do we be as grounded as possible so you can count on the results? Um, trace things back to physics first principles, uh, mathematical logic. Um, so underlying the humor is an aspiration to ad adhere to the truth of the universe as closely as possible. That's really tricky. It is tricky. So that's why, you know, you, you, there's always going to be some amount of error, but we want to um, aspire to be as truthful as possible about the answers uh, with acknowledged error. Um, so that there was always, you don't want to be confidently wrong. So you're not, not going to be right every time, but you don't want to, be, you want to minimize how often you're confidently uh, wrong. And then like I said, once you can count on the logic as being um, not violating physics, then you can start to, to build on that to create uh, inventions, like invent new technologies. But if if you can't if if you if you cannot count on the foundational physics being correct, obviously the inventions are simply wishful thinking, you know, imagination land, magic, basically. Well, as you said, I think one of the big goals of XAI is to understand the universe. Yes, that's our simple three word uh, mission. <laughs> um, if you look out far into the future, do you think? on this level of physics, the very edge of what we understand about physics, do you think it will make discoveries, sort of the sexiest discovery of them as, as we know now, sort of uh, unifying general relativity and quantum mechanics. So coming up with a theory of everything, do you think it could push towards that direction, almost like theoretical physics discoveries? If an AI cannot figure out new physics, um, it's clearly not equal to humans. Let alone, nor, nor has surpassed humans because humans have figured out new physics. They've just, you know, physics is just understanding, you know, deepening one's insight into how reality works, and then, um, then, then there's engineering, which is inventing things that have never existed. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the the range of possibilities for engineering is far greater than for physics, because you know, once you figure out the rules of the universe, uh, that that's that's it. You've discovered things that already existed. Um, but from that, you can then build technologies with that are really almost limitless in the uh, variety and cap. You know, it's like once you understand the rules of the game properly, and we do we, you know, with current physics, we do at least at a local level understand how physics works very well. Where our ability to predict things is incredibly good. Like quantum mechanics is the degree to which quantum mechanics can predict outcomes is incredible. Um, that was my that was my hard, hardest class in college, by the way. <laughs> my, my my senior quantum mechanics class was harder than all of my other classes put together. To get an AI system, a large language model, to to um, reliably be as reliable as quantum mechanics and physics is very difficult. Yeah, you have to test any any conclusions against the ground truth of reality. Reality is the ultimate judge. Like physics is the law; everything else is a recommendation. 
<laughs> I've seen plenty of people break the break the laws made by man, but none break the laws made by physics. Yeah, it's a good test, actually. If this LLM uh, understands and matches physics, then you can more reliably trust whatever it thinks about the current state of yeah. politics. <laughs> in some it, sense, it, and it's it's also not not the case currently that uh, even that its internal logic is not consistent. Mm. Um, so, it's especially. Um, with these, with the approach of like just predicting a token, predict token, predict token, it's like a vector sum. You know, you, you're summing up a bunch of vectors, but you, you can get drift. Um, so as those, a little bit of error, a little bit of error adds up, mm -hmm. and by the time you are many tokens down the path, uh, you're it, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it has to be somehow self aware about the drift. It has to be self aware about the drift, and then look at. The thing as a gestalt as a whole, mm -hmm. and and say it does it have coherence as a whole. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when when authors write books, that they they will write the book and then they'll go and revise it, you know, to take into account, you know, all the, the end and the beginning and the middle and and uh, rewrite it to achieve coherence, so that it doesn't end end up in a nonsensical place. Mm -hmm. Maybe the process of revising is what. Yeah, reasoning is, and then that's the process of rising is how you get closer and closer to the truth. Maybe you like uh, at least I approach it that way. You just say a bunch of bullshit first, and then you get it better. You start at bullshit, yeah. and then you, you get you create a draft, and then and then you <laughs> and then you iterate on that draft um, yeah. until it has, has coherence, until it's, it's it all adds up basically. So another question about theory of everything, but for intelligence, do you think there exists? As you're exploring this with XAI, creating this intelligence system, do you think there is a theory of intelligence where you get to understand what, like, what is the I in AGI and what is the I in um, human intelligence? There's no I in Team America. Oh, wait, there is. Ah, <laughs> uh, now it's gonna be stuck in my head now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's no me and whatever <laughs> uh, in quantum mechanics. Oh wait, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, is that part of the process of discovering, understanding the universe? Is understanding intelligence? Yeah, yeah. I think we need to understand intelligence, understand consciousness. I, I mean, I, there, there. I mean, there are some sort of fundamental questions of like, what is thought? What is emotion? Yeah. Um, is it really just one atom bumping into another atom? It feels like something more than that. Uh, so I, 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 I think we're probably missing some really big things. Um, like s some really big things. Something that'll be obvious in retrospect. Yes. Like there's a giant, like you, you put the whole consciousness, emotion. Well, some people would call it like a, like a soul, you know, in religion yeah, it would be a soul. Um, like you feel like you're you, right? I mean, you don't feel like you're just a collection of atoms. But on what dimension does thought exist? What dimension does do emotions exist? We feel them very strongly. Um, I suspect there's more to it than atoms bumping into atoms. And maybe AI can pave the path to the discovery of what whatever the hell that thing is. Yeah. What is consciousness? Like what if, when you put the atoms in a particular shape, why are they able to form thoughts mm -hmm. and take actions that, that and, and feelings? And even if it is an illusion, why is this illusion so compelling? Yeah. Like how do, Why how, does this illusion exist? <laughs> it, yeah. On, on what plane does this, it, 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 this illusion exist? Yeah. Um, and that sometimes I wonder is, you know, either perhaps everything's conscious or nothing is conscious. Um, one of the two. I like the former. Everything conscious just seems more fun. It does seem more, more fun, yes. Um, but we're, we're composed of atoms, and those atoms are co composed of quarks and leptons. And those quarks and leptons have been around since the beginning of the universe. The beginning of the universe. Right, what, what seems to be the beginning of the universe. The first time we talked, you said what you would, which is surreal to think that this discussion was happening is becoming a reality. I asked you what question would you ask an AGI system once you create it? And you said, what's outside the simulation? 
is the question. And <laughs> good, good question. <laughs> yeah. But it seems like with Grok, you started to it's literally uh, the system's goal is to be able to ask such questions, to answer such questions and yeah. to ask such questions. Where are the aliens? Where are the aliens? That's one of the, the like the Fermi paradox question. Um, a lot of people have asked me if, if I've seen any evidence of aliens and I've, I haven't, which is kind of concerning because then I think would I'd probably prefer to at least to have seen some archeological evidence of aliens. Um, to, to the best of my knowledge, there is no proof. I, I'm not aware of any evidence of aliens. If they're out there, they're very subtle. We might just be the only consciousness, at least in the galaxy. Um, and if you, if you look at, say, the history of Earth, if one is to believe the archeological record, Earth is about four and a half billion years old. Civilization, as measured from the first writing, is only about 5,000 years old. We have to give some credit there to the ancient Sumerians who aren't around anymore. I think it was an archaic pre-cuneiform was the first actual symbolic representation, but only about 5,000 years ago. I think that's a good date for, for when, we're, say, civilization started. That's one millionth of Earth's existence. So civilization has been around, it's really a flash in the pan mm -hmm. so far. Um, and why, why have we, why did it take so long for, you know, four and a half billion years? Um, for the vast majority of the time, there was no life, and, and then there was archaic bacteria for a very long time. And then, you know, you had mitochondria get captured, multicellular life, um, differentiation into plants and animals, life moving from the oceans to land, mammals, um, higher brain functions. And the sun is expanding slowly, um, but it, it, it will, it will overheat, it will, it will heat heat the earth up at some point in the future, um, boil the oceans, and and Earth will become like Venus, where, where no life, life as we know it, is impossible. So if we do not become multiplanetary, and ultimately go beyond our solar system, um, annihilation of all life on Earth is a certainty. A certainty. Um, and it could be as little as <laughs> on the galactic time scale, uh, half a billion years. You know, long time by human standards, but th that's only 10% longer than Earth has been around at all. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if life had taken 10% longer to evolve on Earth, it wouldn't exist at all. We've got a deadline coming up. <laughs> yeah. Better hurry. But that said, as you said, humans, intelligent life on Earth developed a lot of cool stuff very quickly. So yes. it, it seems like becoming multiplanetary is almost inevitable, unless we destroy it. We this need thing. to do it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not, I mean, I, I suspect that they're, they're, if we are able to go out there and explore other star, star systems that we, there's a good chance we find a, a whole bunch of long dead one planet civilizations. Yeah. They never p made it past their home planet. That's so sad. Yeah. That's sad. Also fascinating. I mean, there are various explanations for the Fermi paradox. And one is just the sort of, there are these great vultures, which civilizations don't pass through. And one of those great vultures is, do you become a multi-planet civilization or not? And if you don't, it's simply a matter of time before something happens on your planet. Um, you know, either natural or man-made that causes us to die out, like the dinosaurs. Where are they now? They didn't have spaceships, <laughs> so. I think the more likely thing is, because just to uh, uh, empathize with the aliens, that they, they found us and they're protecting us and letting us be. I hope so, I've been nice aliens. Just like the tribes in the, in the Amazon, the uncontacted tribes were protecting them. That's what, uh, that would be a nice explanation. Or you could have like, uh, what was it? Uh, I think Andre Kapathi said it's like the ants in the Amazon asking, where's everybody? 
<laughs> well, they do run into a lot of other ants. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so these ant wars. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good TV show. Yeah, they literally have these big wars between various ants. Yeah, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm just uh, <laughs> uh, dismissing all the different diversity of ants. You should listen to that Werner Herzog talking about the jungle. It's really <laughs> hilarious. Have you heard it? No, I have not. Awesome. But Werner Herzog is a way. <laughs> <laughs> you should play. You should play it for, for the you know as an interlude in the. Yeah. <laughs> it's on YouTube. It's it's awesome. <laughs> I love him so much. Yeah, uh, he's great. Was he the director of Happy People, Life in the Taiga? I think also. He did that bear documentary. The bear documentary. He did this thing about penguins. Yeah. (laughs) The the depressed, the analysis, the psychoanalysis (laughs) of a penguin. Yeah, the penguins like headed for like mountains like that are like 70 miles away. (laughs) And penguin is just headed for doom basically. Well, he had a cynical take. I I have a, he could be just the brave explorer and and there'll be great stories told about him amongst the penguin population for many centuries to come. Um, <laughs> what are we talking about? Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, aliens, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Look, I think it, the smart move uh, is just, you know, w- w- this is the first time in the history of Earth that it's been possible for life to ex- ex- extend beyond Earth. Um, that window is open. Mm. Um, now it may be open for a long time or it may be open for a short time and it, it may be open now and then never open again. So I, th- I think the smart move here is to make life multiplanetary while it is possible to do so. We don't want to be one of those lame one planet civilizations no. that just dies out. No, those are lame. Yeah, lame. <laughs> um, <laughs> self-respecting civilization would be one planet. There's not going to be a Wikipedia entry for one of those. And uh, pause. Uh, does SpaceX have an official uh, policy for when we meet aliens? No. <laughs> okay. That seems irresponsible. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, if, 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 if I see the slightest indication that there are aliens, I will immediately post on the X platform yeah. anything I know. It could be the most liked, reposted post of all time. Yeah, I mean, look, we we have more satellites up there right now than everyone else combined. So, you know, we'd know we know if we've got to maneuver around something, and we're not I don't have to maneuver around anything. If we go to the big questions once again, you said you've uh, you're with Einstein that you believe in the God of Spinoza. <laughs> yes. Uh, so you know that that's a view that God is like the universe and is reveals himself through the laws of physics, or as Einstein said, through the lawful harmony of the world. Yeah, I would agree that, that God or the, the simulator or whatever, the, the supreme being or beings, um, uh, re- re- reveal themselves through the physics. You know, they're creators of this existence. And it's incumbent upon us to try to understand more about this wondrous creation. Who created this thing? Who's running this thing? Like embodying it into a, a singular question with a sexy word on top of it is like focusing the mind to understand. It, it does seem like there's a, um, again, it could be an illusion. It's, it seems like there's a purpose, that there's an underlying master plan of some kind. And it seems like. There may not be a master plan in the sense. That, so there's like maybe an interesting answer to the question of determinism versus free will is that if we are in a simulation, the reason that the, the, these higher beings would hold a simulation is to see what happens. Mm-hmm. So it's not, um, they don't know what happens. Uh, otherwise they wouldn't hold the simulation. Mm-hmm. So when, when humans create a simulation, so it's SpaceX and Tesla, we create simulations all the time. Um, especially for the rocket, you, you, uh, you, know, you have to run a lot of simulations to understand what's gonna happen because you can't really test the rocket until it goes to space and you want it to work. So you have to, you have to simulate the subsonic, transonic, hyper, uh, supersonic, hypersonic um, ascent and then coming back, super high heating and um, orbital dynamics. All this has gotta be simulated. So, uh, cause you don't get very many kicks at the can. But we, we run the simulations to see what happens, not. If we knew what happens, we wouldn't run the simulation. 
Mm-hmm. So if if there's so whoever created this existence um, is they're running it because they don't know what's going to happen, not because they do. So maybe uh, we both played Diablo. Maybe Diablo was created to see if a druid, your character, could defeat Uber Lilith at the end. They didn't know. Well, the funny thing is that Uber Lilith, uh, her title is Hatred Incarnate. Yeah. Um, and right now, I guess, <laughs> you, can, you can ask the Diablo team, but it's almost impossible to defeat Hatred uh, in the eternal realm. Yeah, you've streamed yourself dominating tier 100 nightmare yeah, dungeons I can, and still. I, I can cruise through tier 100 nightmare dungeons like a stroll in the park. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and still you're defeated by hatred. Yeah, I can, there's the, the sort of, I guess maybe the second hardest boss is Duriel. Duriel can't even scratch the paint. Mm-hmm. So uh, I killed Duriel, Duriel so many times. Um, and every other boss in the game, all, all of them, Kill him so many times, it's easy. Um, but uh, Uber Lilith, otherwise known as Hatred Incarnate, especially if you're a druid and you have no ability to go in, to be invulnerable, you, the, you, there are these <laughs> random death waves that that come at you. Um, and I'm pretty, you know, I'm really I'm 52, so my reflexes are not what they used to be. But I'm I have a lifetime of playing video games. Um, at one point, I was you know, maybe one of the best Quake players in the world. Um, actually won money for, for in, in, in what I think was the first paid esports tournament in the US. Um, we're, we're doing, doing four person Quake tournaments. And um, we came second. I was the second best person on the team. And uh, the, the, the actual best person, that we were, were actually winning, we were going to come first, except the best person on the team, his computer crashed halfway through the game. Um, so we, we came second. <laughs> but I got money for it. And everything. So, like, basically, I got skills. You mm-hmm. know, albeit, you know, no, no spring, spring chicken these days. And um, the to be totally frank, it's driving me crazy <laughs> trying to beat Lilith as a druid. Basically, trying to trying to beat <laughs> trying to beat hatred incarnate in the eternal realm as a druid. <laughs> as a druid. And if you if you if you <laughs> this is really. <laughs> Vexing, let me tell you. Um, I mean, the challenge is part of the fun. I, I have seen directly, like you're actually like a world class, incredible video game player. Yeah, and, and I think Diablo. So you're just picking up a new game, mm-hmm. and you're figuring out its fundamentals. You're also with the Paragon board and, and the build. Are not somebody like me who perfectly follows whatever they suggest on the internet. You're also an innovator there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is hilarious to watch. It's like a it's like a mad scientist just trying to figure out the Paragon board and, and, and the build and the yeah. you know. Um is there some interesting insights there about um if, if somebody's starting as a druid, do you have advice? Um <laughs> I would not recommend playing a druid in the Eternal no. Realm. Um right now I think the most powerful character in this in the seasonal realm is the sorcerer with the lightning balls. Mm-hmm. So the the sorks have huge balls in um the seasonal. Well, yeah, that's what they say. <laughs> so, 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 so excited, huge balls. Um, they do, uh, huge balls of lightning. Um, I, I'll take your word for it. And it's actually in, in the seasonal realm that you can, you can, it's it's like pretty easy to beat uh, Uber Lilith with the, va- the va- because you get these vampiric powers that amplify your damage and increase your defense and whatnot. So, um, but really quite easy to, to defeat uh, hatred seasonally. But to defeat hatred eternally, it's very difficult. Um, almost impossible. It's virtually <laughs> impossible. It, it seems like this is a, a metaphor for life. You know? yeah. I like the idea that Elon Musk, because I saw, I was playing Diablo yesterday and I saw 100, level 100 druid just run by, I will never die. <laughs> and then run back the other way. <laughs> yeah. And it was, there's just some, this metaphor is kind of hilarious that you, Elon Musk, is fighting hatred restlessly fighting hatred in this demonic realm. Yes. It's, it's hilarious. I mean, it's pretty hilarious. No, it's absurd. Uh, <laughs> really, it's exercise in absurdity, and it makes me want to pull my hair out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, what do you get from video games in general? Is there, is there for you, for you personally? I mean, it's, it's I don't know, if I, it's, uh, it calms my mind. I mean, you sort of, 
killing the, the demons in a video game calms the demons in my mind. Yeah. I, it, if, if you play a tough video game, you can get into like a state of flow, which is very enjoyable. Um, and uh, it, but the, the, admittedly, it, it needs to be not too easy, not too hard. Um, kind of in the Goldilocks zone. Um, and I guess you generally want to feel like you're progressing in the game. So um, a good video. And, and there's also beautiful art, um, engaging storylines. Um, and it's a, it's, it's like an amazing puzzle to solve, I think. And so it, it's like solving the puzzle. Elden Ring, the greatest game of all time. I still haven't played it, but to you. It's, Elden Ring is definitely a candidate for best game ever. Top five, for sure. I think I've been scared how hard it is, or how hard I hear it is. So, but it is beautiful. Elden Ring is, feels like it's designed by an alien. Hmm. Um, There's a theme to this discussion. In what it's, way? It's, it's, it's so unusual. It's incredibly creative mm -hmm. and the art is stunning. I recommend playing it on a, on a big resolution, high dynamic range TV even. Mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be a monitor. Just a, the art is incredible. It's so beautiful. And, and it's it's so unusual. Um, and each of those top boss battles is unique. Like it's like a unique puzzle to solve. Mm -hmm. Each one's different. Um, and the, the strategy you use to solve one battle is di different from another battle. That said, you said Druid and Eternal against Uber Lilith is the hardest boss battle you've ever. Correct. That is. Currently, the the and I've I've played a lot of video games because my, it's my, my primary rec recreational activity. Yes. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> yes, <laughs> beating hatred in the eternal realm yeah. is the hardest boss battle <laughs> in life and in the video game. Metaphor on top. I'm, like, of I don't metaphor. know. If, I don't, I'm not top sure it's possible, metaphor. but it's it, it, it's. I do make progress. So then I'm like, okay, I'm making progress. Maybe if I just tweak that Paragon board a little more, mm -hmm. I can do it. I can just dodge a few more waves. Mm -hmm. uh, I can do it. Well, the simulation um, is created for the purpose of figuring out if it can be done. And you're just a cog in that simulation, in the machine of the simulation. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> I, 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 I have a feeling that at least, I, th I think it's doable. It's, it's doable, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the human spirit right there to believe. Yeah, I mean, it did prompt me to think about just hate in general, which is you know you you, you, want, you want to be careful of the, one of those things where you wish for something that sounds good, but in but if you get it, it's actually a dystopian situation. So, you know, you could sort of run a sort of a hypothesis of like, if you wish for world peace, sounds good, mm -hmm. but how is it enforced? And, and at what cost is, is it, what, at what cost eternal peace? It might actually be worse to have eternal peace because of what that would entail. The suppression of everyone, it might be the suppression of progress. It might be an ossified society that never changes. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that there is an argument that you, you that if that if you wish for no war, you should be careful what you wish for, because what's required in order for there to be no war it might be worse than a little war. Yeah, the things we consider to be flaws of human civilization might be a necessary components for, for whatever optimal looks like. Um, I mean, this do you worry about AI, AGI enabling a dystopian state of this nature, whether it's 1984 with surveillance and fear or Brave New World with pleasure? <laughs> <laughs> and what is it, Lo lots of sex, but no uh, deep human experience? You know, there's actually a real drug called soma. There is. It, yes. <laughs> I'm like, Let me I take wonder, notes. Did they actually? Does Grok know about it? <laughs> no, he probably will go we, to Brave New World. <laughs> we could ask it. What What would be the question? Tell us about the drug called soma. Tell us about the drug called 
drug called Soma. It's going to go to Brave New World, I think. Well, there's a real drug as well. Searching for Soma drug information. <laughs> 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 oh, boy. Ah, Soma, the wonder drug. By the way, I'm in fun mode. Oh, okay, fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's talking about the real drug. Oh, it's a muscle relaxant that's been around since the 1950s. It's used to treat muscle pain and discomfort, and it does this by altering the activity between neurons and the spinal cord. Now, Soma isn't just a pain reliever. It's also a bit of a sedative. It can make you feel a bit drowsy, so it's not something to take if you're planning on operating heavy machinery or trying to solve complex math equations. <laughs> and it goes on and on. In conclusion, Soma is a drug that can be helpful for those dealing with muscle pain, but it's not without its risks pretty good oh wait a minute that's the real drug it's talking about that's the real drug yeah uh and of course the fun is always use it responsibly in accordance with the advice of a healthcare professional and remember in the end the universe is probably just a giant computer simulation so don't take anything too seriously i love it <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it <laughs> i love it, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah so, oh and also uh, really nicely uh includes like uh the, the tweets posts on x that are relevant to this which is really cool yeah. It like integrates everything together. Yeah. Like the interface is one of the really cool things here. Yeah. Seems like a great job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and you could say like, you could say like, no, I, no, I mean Soma from Brave, Brave New World. Because it, it thinks you mean, you, you mean Soma the real drug. Yeah. No, I mean Soma from Brave New World. It's going to be like, oops, I'm really sorry. I'm really surprised it went to the real drug first. Ah, my apologies. <laughs> I was thinking of the muscle relaxant. Soma for Brave New World is a different beast altogether. <laughs> now this Huxley's dystopia. Now Soma is a drug that plays a central role in the society depicted in the book. It's a mood-altering, hallucinogenic drug that's used to keep the population docile and content in the novel. To use Soma in Brave New World raises some interesting questions about the nature of happiness and the role of drugs in society. Oh man! Exactly. Is it better to live in a world where everyone is happy all the time, even if that happiness happiness is artificial? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. This is what I mean. Like, do you want? Do you wish for world peace and and happiness all the time? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. um, because that might be a society that is essentially sterile and ossified that never changes, that is ultimately doomed. This kind of tension between uh, I mean, this, darkness I mean, and the it's, light. It's, 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 this is a, really a very good summary. Um, mm -hmm. It really gets to the point. If this is not simply regurgitating uh, Brave New World, it's actually getting to the, the, the salient element of Soma as a drug. Um, do, you, do you actually want to be in a, a situation where everyone is happy all the time, even though it's artificial? Or is it better to confront the challenges of life and experience the full range of human emotions, even if it means experiencing pain and suffering? For those listening, by the way, Elon just read directly from Grok, which is a really nice kind of insightful philosophical analysis of the tension here. Interesting. It pretty much nails it. In conclusion, Soma from Brave New World is a fictional drug that's used to explore some deep philosophical questions about the nature of happiness and the role of drugs in society. It's a powerful symbol of the dangers of using drugs to escape from reality and the importance of confronting the challenges of life head on. Nailed it. And the crazy thing is like, you know, we do have a real drug called Soma, which kind of does, is kind of like the drug in the book. <laughs> and I'm like, did they, they must've named, they must've named it after. Yeah, something. probably, probably. Yeah. Soma, the real drug is quite effective on back pain. So you know about this drug. I've taken it's it. It's fascinating. Okay. Because I had like a you know squashed uh, disc in my C five C six, so it takes the physical pain away. But soma here is... it doesn't completely. It, it it reduces the amount of pain you feel, but at the expense of mental acuity. Mm. It dulls your mind, <laughs> just like the, just like the drug in the book. <laughs> just like the drug in the book. Yeah, and hence the wow. trade off. Uh, yeah. The thing that seems like utopia could be a dystopia after all. Yeah, and actually, I was talking to a friend of mine. Um, saying like, would you really want there to be no hate in the world? Like really none? Like I wonder why hate evolved. Um, I'm not saying we should amplify hate, of course. I think we should try to minimize it, but but none at all. Hmm. 
there might be a reason for hate. And suffering. And it's really complicated to consider that uh, some amount of human suffering is necessary for human flourishing. Is it possible to appreciate the highs without knowing the lows? And that 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 all is summarized there in a single <laughs> statement from Grog. Okay. No highs, no lows. <laughs> Who knows? That's almost a poem. Uh, it seems that training LLMs efficiently is a big focus for XAI. Uh, what's the uh, first of all? What's the limit of what's possible in terms of efficiency? It, there's this uh, terminology of useful productivity per watt. Like what have you learned from yeah. pushing the limits of that? Well, I, I think it's helpful. The, the tools of physics are very powerful and can be applied, I think, to almost any, really, any arena in life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really just uh, critical thinking. For something important, you need to reason with, from first principles and think about things in the limit, one direction or the other. So um, in the limit, even at the Kardashev scale, meaning even if you harness the entire power of the sun, you will still care about useful compute per watt. So that's where, I, I think probably where things are headed from uh, the standpoint of AI is that we, we have a silicon shortage now that will transition to a voltage transformer shortage in about a year. Mm -hmm. Ironically, transformers for transformers. <laughs> <laughs> you need, you need transformers to run transformers. Somebody has a sense of humor in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Fate loves irony. <laughs> Ironic humor. And an ironically funny outcome seems to be often what fate wants. Humor is all you need. I think spice <laughs> is all you need, somebody posted. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, so so we're, we're, we're have a silicon shortage today. Um, a voltage step down transformer shortage probably in about a year and then just electricity shortages in general in about two years. I, I gave a speech for the sort of world gathering of utility companies, electricity companies. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I said, look, you really need to prepare for a tripling of electricity demand um, because all transport is gonna go electric with the ironic exception of rockets and, uh, and, and heating um, will also go electric. Um, so energy usage right now is roughly one third, very rough terms, one third ele electricity, one third transport, one third heating. Um, and so in order for everything to go sustainable, to go electric, um, you uh, need to triple electricity output. So I encourage the utilities to uh, build more power plants and, and also to probably have well, well, not probably. They should definitely buy more batteries because the the grid currently is sized for real time load, which is kind of crazy. Because you know that means you got to size for whatever the the peak electricity demand is, like the worst second or the worst day of the year, mm -hmm. or you can have a, a brownout or a blackout. And you know that we had that crazy blackout for several days in in, in Austin. Um, so uh, because the, there's almost no buffering of energy in the grid. Like if you've got a hydro power plant, you can buffer energy, but otherwise um, it's all real time. So with batteries, you can you can produce energy at night and use it during the day. So you can buffer. So I, I expect that there will be very heavy usage of, of batteries in the future. Because the, the peak to trough ratio for power plants is anywhere from two to five. You know, so it's like lowest point to highest point. So like batteries are necessary to balance it out. And then, but the demand as you're saying is going to grow, 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 grow. Yeah. And part of that is the compute. Yes, yes. I mean, electrification, I mean, electrification of transport uh, and, and electric heating will, will be much bigger than AI, at least. In the short term. In the short term. Um, but. But even for, for AI, the, like you, you really have a growing demand for electricity for electric vehicles and a growing demand for electricity for to run the computers for AI. Mm -hmm. And so this is obviously leading, gonna lead to a short, an electricity shortage. How difficult is the problem of, uh, in this particular case, maximizing the useful productivity per watt for training neural nuts? Like this seems to be 
really where the big problem we're facing that needs to be solved is how to use the power efficiently. Like what you've learned so far about applying this physics, first principle of reasoning in this domain, how difficult is this problem? It will get solved, it's just a question of how long it takes to solve it. So it, it, at various points, there's a limit, some some kind of limiting factor to progress. Um, and when, I, with regard to AI, I'm saying like right, right now, the limiting factor is uh, silicon chips. Um, mm -hmm. And that will, we're gonna then have more chips than we can actually plug in and turn on, um, probably in about a year. Um, the The initial constraint being literally voltage step down transformers, mm -hmm. because you've got um, power coming in at 300,000 300, 300, volts, and it's got to step all the way down eventually to around 0.7 volts. So it's a very big amount of, you know, the voltage step down is gigantic. Um, so, and, and the, the industry is not used to rapid growth. Okay, let's talk about the competition here. You've shown concern about Google and Microsoft with OpenAI developing uh, AGI. How can you help ensure with XAI and uh, Tesla AI work that it doesn't become a competitive race to AGI, but instead is a collaborative development of safe AGI? Well, I, I mean, I've been pushing for some kind of regulatory oversight for a long time. I've been somewhat of a Cassandra on the subject for over a decade. Um, I think we want to be very careful in how we develop AI. Um, it's it's a it's a great power, and with great power comes great responsibility. Um, I think it it would be wise for us to have at least um, an objective third party who can be like a referee that can go in and understand what the various leading players are doing with AI. And even if there's no enforcement ability, they should they can at least voice concerns mm -hmm. um, publicly. Um, you know, J Jeff Hinton, for example, le left Google and he voiced strong concerns, but now he's not at Google anymore. So who's gonna voice the concerns? So I think, I think there's, I, 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 like I, you know, Tesla gets a lot of regulatory oversight on the automotive front. I mean, we're subject to, I think, over a hundred regulatory agencies domestically and internationally. So it's a, it's a lot. Um, you could fill this room with the all the regulations that Tesla has to adhere to for automotive. Um, same is true in, you know, for rockets and for, you know, um, currently the limiting factor for SpaceX for Starship launch is regulatory approval. Uh, the FAA has actually given their approval, but we're, we're waiting for Fish and Wildlife to uh, finish their analysis and give their approval. That, that's why I posted, I want to buy a fish license on, <laughs> which also refers to the Monty Python sketch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, why do you need a license for your fish? I, I don't know. <laughs> why, but according to the rules, I'm told you need some sort of fish license or something. We effectively need a fish license to launch a rocket. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a second, how did the fish come into the picture? Yeah. Um, I mean, so, some of the things like that, that it's, I feel like are so absurd that I want to do like a comedy sketch and flash at the bottom, this is all real. This yeah. is actually what happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that was a bit of a challenge at one point is that they were worried about uh, our rocket hitting a shark. Mm -hmm. And, um, now the ocean is very big, and uh, how often do you see sharks? Uh, not that often, you know. As a percentage of ocean surface area, sharks basically are zero. And 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 so then we will, then we said, well, how will we calculate the probability of, of telling a shark? And they're like, well, we can't give you that information because we're, they're worried about shark hunt, shark fin hunters uh, going and hunting sharks. And I said, well, how are we supposed to? We're on the horns of a dilemma then. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> then they said, well, there's another part of fish and wildlife that can can do this analysis. I'm like, well, why don't you give them the data? I'm like, we don't, they don't, we don't trust them. I'm like, excuse me? You don't, they're literally in your department. Yeah. And again, this is actually what happened. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then can you do an NDA or something? <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, they managed to solve the internal quandary and indeed uh, the probability of, say, of us hitting a shark is essentially zero. Um, then there's another organization that I didn't realize existed until 
uh, you know, a few months ago, uh, that cares about whether you, we would potentially hit a whale in international waters. Now, again, you look at the surface of the, look at the, look at the Pacific and say, what percentage of this, the Pacific consists of whale? Like, he'll give you a big picture and like point out all the whales in this picture. And I'm like, I don't see any whales. <laughs> it's like basically 0%. Um, and if our rocket does hit a whale, which is extremely unlikely beyond all belief, um, that is the, the fate had it in, that's a, a whale has some seriously bad luck. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the least lucky whale ever. Um, and um, I mean, this is quite absurd. Yeah, uh, bureaucracy, <laughs> the bureaucracy of this, however it emerged. Yes, well, I, I mean, when, one of the things that's pretty wild is um, for launching out of Vandenberg in California, we had to, they were worried about uh, seal procreation, whether the seals would be dismayed by the sonic booms. Um, now, there've been a lot of rockets launched out of Vandenberg and the seal population has uh, steadily increased. Um, so if anything, rocket booms are an aphrodisiac. Um, based on the evidence, if you would correlate rock launches with uh, seal population. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, we were forced to kidnap a seal, strap it to a board, put it headphones on the seal, and play sonic boom sounds to it to see if it would be distressed. This is an actual thing that happened. This is actually real. I have pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would love, love to see this. Yeah. There's, I mean, a, oh, sorry, there's a seal, a seal with headphones. <laughs> yes, it's a seal with headphones yeah. strapped to a board. And and like, the okay, now the amazing part is how calm the seal was. Yeah. Because if I was a seal, I'd be like, this is the end. <laughs> 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 They're definitely going to eat me. Yeah. Um, how will the seal, when the seal goes back to other, you know, its seal friends, how's it going to explain that? They're never going to believe them. Never going to believe them. That's why I'm like, well, you know, it's sort of like it's like getting kidnapped by aliens and getting an anal probe, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you come back and say, I swear to God, yeah. I got kidnapped by aliens and they stuck an anal probe in my butt. And you're like, no, they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's it's seal some, it's seal buddies are never going to believe him that he gets strapped to a board and they put headphones on his ears. <laughs> <laughs> and then let him go. <laughs> twice, by the way. We had to do it twice. Th they let him go twice. We had to catch the same seal. Well, no, different seal. Oh, okay. <laughs> did you uh, did you get a seal of approval? <laughs> yeah, <Sorry>. exactly. <laughs> a seal sorry. of approval. No, I mean this is right. this is like I don't think the public is quite aware of the the madness that goes on. Yeah, it's yeah, it, it's absurd. Freaking seals with freaking headphones. headphones. I mean, this is the I mean, <laughs> it's a good encapsulation of of the absurdity of human civilization: seals and headphones. Yes. Uh, what are the pros and cons of open sourcing AI to you as another way to combat, um, you know, a company running away with AGI? In order to run uh, like really deep intelligence, you need a lot of compute. So it's not like, you know, you can just fire up a PC in your basement and be running AGI, at least not yet. Um, You know, Grok was trained on 8,000 A100s running at peak efficiency. Um, and Grok's going to get a lot better, by the way. We will be more than doubling our compute every couple months for the next several months. There's a nice write-up of how it went from Grok 0 to Grok 1. By Grok? <laughs> yeah, by like Grok just bragging, making <laughs> shit up about itself. <laughs> just Grok, Grok, Grok? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a weird AI dating site where it exaggerates <laughs> about itself. No, there's a there's a write up of you know like where where it stands now, the history of its development, um, and where it stands on on some benchmarks compared to the state of the art GPT three five. And so, I mean, there's a uh, you know there's uh, Llama. You you can open source once it's trained. You can open source a model. Yeah. And for fine tuning and all that kind of stuff. Like what to you is the pros and cons of that, of open sourcing based models? Um, I think there's some merit to open sourcing. I think perhaps with a slight time delay, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, six, six months even. Um, I think I'm, I'm generally in favor of open sourcing, like bias was open sourcing. Um, 
I mean, it it is a concern to me that you know, opening. I, you know, I was, you know, argue, I think I guess arguably the the, the prime, the, the, you know, prime mover behind OpenAI in the sense that it was created because of discussions that I had with uh, Larry Page um, back when he and I were were friends, and you know, I'd stay at his house and I uh, talked to him about AI safety, and and Larry did not care about AI safety, or at least at the time he didn't. Um, you know, and, and at one point he called me a species for being pro-human, mm-hmm. and I'm like. Well, what team are you on, Larry? Uh, you're on Team Robot. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So at the time, you know, uh, Google Google had acquired DeepMind. They had uh, probably two thirds of all AI research. You know, probably two thirds of all the AI researchers in the world. Mm-hmm. They had basically inf- infinite money and in compute. And the guy in charge, you know, Larry Page. Did not care about safety, and even yelled at me, um, and, and and called me a species and pro human. So I don't know if you so know about humans; they can change their mind, and maybe you and Larry Page can still can be friends once more. I'd like to be friends with Larry again. Um, he he's he, he got uh, really the, the 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 breaking of the friendship was over OpenAI, um, and specifically, um, I think the the, the key moment was. Uh, recruiting Ilya Sitzkaya. Um so I love Ilya. He's so brilliant. Ilya's good, good human, uh, smart, good heart. Um, and um, that was that was a tough recruiting battle. Um, it was mostly Demis on one side and me on the other, both trying to recruit Ilya. And Ilya went back and forth. You know, he's going to stay at Google. He was going to leave, then he was going to stay, then he was leave, and and finally he he did agree to join OpenAI. Uh, that was one of the toughest recruiting battles we've ever had, and but that that was really the the linchpin for OpenAI uh, being successful. And I was, you know, also instrumental in recruiting a number of other people, and I provided all of the funding in the beginning, uh, over forty million dollars, um, and the name. <laughs> Uh, the the open and open AI is supposed to mean open source, and it was created as a nonprofit open source, and now it is a closed source for maximum profit, which I think is not good karma. But like we talked about with war and leaders talking, I do hope that there's only a few folks working on this at the highest level. I do hope you reinvigorate friendships here. Like I said, I'd like to be friends again with Larry. I haven't seen him in ages. Um, and we were friends for a very long time. I met I met Larry Page before he got funding for Google, or actually, I guess before he got venture funding. I think he he got the first like hundred k from wow. I think Bechtel's time or someone. Um, it's wild to think about all that happened, and you've guys known each other that whole time. It's just twenty yeah, years since maybe ninety eight or something. Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy yeah. how much has happened since then. Yeah, twenty five years. At least a lot has happened. It's insane. But you're seeing the tension there, like maybe delayed open source. Delayed, I, yeah. Like, what is the source that is open? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, there's basically, it's a giant CSV file. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> with a bunch of numbers. Yep. Um, what do you do with that giant file of numbers? You know, how do you run? Like, the amount of actual, the, the lines of code is very small. Mm-hmm. Um, and and most of the work, um, the software work, is in the in the curation of the data. So it's like trying to figure out what data is separating good data from bad data. Like um, like you can't just crawl the internet because there's a lot of junk out there. Mm-hmm. Um, a huge percentage of websites have more noise than signal. You know they're they're or because they're just used for search engine optimization. They're literally just scam websites. So, um, how do you, by the way, sorry to interrupt, get the signal, separate the signal and noise on X? It's such a fascinating source of data. Uh, you know, no offense to people posting on X, but sometimes there's a little bit of noise. So, what? yeah, I think the signal to noise could be greatly improved. I mean, I, really, all of the posts on the X platform uh, should be AI recommended, meaning like we should populate a vector space around any given post. Uh, compare that to the vector space around any user and match the two. Mm-hmm. 